Tonight, Awakening Spirituality, a conversation with Marion Williamson. spiritual traditions, East, West, and indigenous across the planet and through the ages, seem to converge on one great insight, that we humans are essentially spiritual beings and that our human flourishing turns on awakening to this truth of who we are and living mindful lives in touch with the sacredness of everyday life. And yet most of us seem to continue to live our daily lives in stressful and fragmented patterns that cut us off from the spiritual wholeness, inner peace, and joyous living. Why is it so difficult for us to practice and live as whole, integral beings? And what can we do to transform our daily patterns and move with grace through life? We're delighted to have with us tonight renowned author and teacher Marion Williamson. Marion is number one New York Times best-selling author of A Return to Love, A Woman's Worth, Healing the Soul of America, Enchanted Love, and Illuminata. Her books have been translated into more than 20 languages, and she's grown into a global and international presence. Marion is a powerful and brilliant speaker who moves her audiences to spiritual awakenings. She's a global teacher at the forefront of the spiritual revival in this country and around the globe. And her most recent book just appearing is Everyday Grace. Marion, welcome to Philly Live. Thank you so much. Pleasure to have you Thank here. Thank you. I'm enjoying reading this very much. Thank Congratulations you. Congratulations on this. Thank you I so much. I understand it's also a, already a number one. It has been, yes. Well, congratulations. Number one I can understand Thank why. You. Thank you. And help us to get into the topic of Everyday Grace and a spirituality in our lives, because most people have so much trouble. <clears throat> and I know you're trying to l look at that in some depth here. Well, what I found in my life, and I've certainly see, seen it as an issue for others, is that sometimes an idea will penetrate my intellect before it penetrates my nervous system. There's a time lag between my, the time in which I embrace an idea, recognize its truth, really maybe even passionately uh, believe in it and feel devoted to it, and the time when I can honestly embody it and practice it in everyday life. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wanted to write this book that I think of as a kind of handbook for the contemporary mystic. Mm -hmm. We believe in lofty ideals of greater love on the planet and forgiveness and harmony and peace, but we can't quite hold it together as well as we might or as well as we'd like to when somebody cuts us off in traffic or we lose our job or somebody's rude at a store or our children give us problems or whatever it is. So that's where I think the rubber meets the road. There is at this point, I think, already in this nation, a collective abstract understanding, yeah. both the truth of universal <coughs> spiritual themes and the need for their application. But translating that into our capacity yeah every moment of the day to practice what we believe in right. is and another issue and that's what this book is about. Wonderful and I, you know that's really a global theme <coughs> for all spiritual traditions uh, translating from that concept level of the mind into practice where it's ingrained in our bodies. You know. In the Course in Miracles it's called the journey without distance from the head to the heart. Mm -hmm. It's and the longest trip we ever make. Right, and, and yet that seems to be one of the barriers that we have to, to bring this into our lives, even things that we may know well, That's absolutely, because if you stay only in your mind, you can resist love. Mm -hmm. Freud said intelligence will be used in service of the neurosis. Mm -hmm. The mind can go either way. The mind can be in service to love, to God, or it can be used in service to the ego, and we all see that. So the mind can actually be a trap and a barrier. Of course. To this. So in a way, we have to get out of our mind. And all the great religious traditions in their own way speak to this. Oh, that's right. I know the Eastern thought talks about being egocentric and trapped right. in the ego and not being able to be in the moment. And even in the Christian tradition, that's actually what the, what the devil is. Mm -hmm. It's the mind turned away from love. Right. And separated. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of this kind of living <coughs> everyday spirit, do, do you think then that we're spiritual beings? You spoke about a spiritual mystic, uh, as if people think of this as something very distant and ex exotic and unique. 
are everyday people spiritual beings? Well, of course, that's that's the belief that that we are all. What is you know? It's almost a cliche to say it now. We're not humans having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. All the great religious teachings of the world have their mystical teachings at their core. And of course, mysticism is not a religion. It's a conviction of the heart. That's how Manly Hall described mm -hmm. it a conviction of the heart. So if you go throughout the great religious and philosophical traditions, there's that basically universal common theme mm -hmm. of living from the heart. Living from God and living from the heart are ultimately the same thing. Right. I know in Eastern traditions, the meditative awakening is very important of getting into the heart, becoming whole. So that we can have compassion. Right. That's, that's the healing. Mm -hmm. And if you're not in your own heart and you're separated from your heart and you remain in your head, it's amazing how uncompassionate we can be. Yes, but it's amazing when you opened uh, a while ago, you spoke about this book is written for everyday people who are naturally mystically oriented, so to speak. And yet, if you <coughs> look at the culture, I, I know in the academic circles, for example, where I live, uh, that uh, spirituality is not very much on campus. Yes. You know, the academic world, for example, is certainly not, you know, you don't get the feeling that it's even that we have the spiritual commitment, but we can't put it into practice. It doesn't even seem to be on campus. Well, the main institutional identities that define our society, it tends to be profoundly over-secularized. And if you look at this in the broader historical context, you can go back to the advent of the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. at the end of the 19th century. The, the emergence in Britain first and then in the United States of, 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 of an entire uh, worldview that became so dominant, we were so mesmerized by machinery and technology and science. Mm -hmm. It became such a, a mesmerizing external drama that it's almost as though we were lured away from things of the spirit. Now, if you look at some Eastern nations that did not have this tremendous technological explosion, perhaps on a certain level they were saved from that particular profound temptation mm -hmm. to look outside. And that's why in our, in our society, if you look at people like Walt Whitman and Emerson and Thoreau, the transcendentalists, and in England, writers and painters and philosophers. I think it's in the Quaker tradition. Too. Absolutely, the Quaker tradition, who tried so hard to really warn Western civilization mm. not to become imbalanced. But we just went on ahead. Right. And of course, this really climaxed in the middle of the 20th century, so that we have materially moved so far ahead, but we have outdistanced ourselves spiritually. Right. We have this profound technological and material achievement that does not in any way uh, balance with the spiritual achievement that needs to go along with that in order to have a balanced humanity. So, so, so what do you say to individuals who may be of that orientation of the secular, so to speak, who right. think that spirituality should not be on campus, for example, or not be in the public civic space? How do you respond to <coughs> them? What kind of well, I think people need to understand the difference between a religious conversation and a spiritual conversation. You know, our founders introduced into our um, governmental structure, a separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. This is a very enlightened concept, but we need to be clear about what it means. What our founders were saying is that we want the government to be able to do its business without a priest or a rabbi or a mufti or anyone else saying you can't pass this or that law or you must pass this or that law because of our religious doctrine. That's number one, protection of, of governmental conversation. But also it was meant to protect the religious conversation. It was not meant to suppress the religious conversation, but to liberate it by saying that government cannot any way tell you what you should believe, what religion, or whether or not you should have any religion. Mm -hmm. So our founders, who were in some cases religious people, and in most cases spiritual people, mm -hmm. um, did not mean to, to be suppressing a conversation about deeper moral and spiritual issues. Right. And I think that we have become, there's a profound misunderstanding of this. Right. I also think today, because there are religions, one in particular, that is so big on proselytizing and so big on the notion that they're the only way, that there is a lot of somewhat understandable fear that that particular force... Might compromise the public civic space. Yes. But you do think then that uh, spiritual topics belong <coughs> in open conversation. If you're going to have any conversation of fundamental relevance to the evolution of the human species at this time. And how can you have a relevant conversation about the evolution of a culture if it's not within the broader context of the revolution, uh, evolution of humanity itself? Mm -hmm. You can't have a foundational conversation without talking about our spirituality, because our spirituality is the foundational issue of humanity, right. of the human experience. Right, well, just to, in case you're just joining us, 
Uh, we're here with a very exciting speaker, teacher, author, Marian Williamson. And we're talking about awakening spirituality individually and in the society. And uh, we're going to continue this now by going in greater depth, Marian, in terms of this book. How do we translate from the head to the heart? This is what's so brilliant in the <coughs> book. You help with meditations and practices and in everyday life. I mean, can this happen for a business person in his, her everyday life? Well, yes, you know, business person is, is a kind of abstraction. A business person is just a human being, right? right? And we don't heal, we don't make this journey that you're speaking of from the head to the heart in broad strokes. We make this journey one moment at a time, one realization at a time, one situation or conversation in, or circumstance in which we stand in front of another person and take the more compassionate, forgiving, loving, supportive role in their lives, then we might. We say, I won't be petty here, I won't be judgmental here, I won't be domineering here, I'm going to try to be a more noble person than I might have been. And when it comes to the workplace, as we know, you, the average American spends more time with people we work with than with our own families. Mm -hmm. So it's just one more place where God uses relationships as his laboratory, as it were. It's moment by moment, just like in AA, they say it's day by day, one day at a time. In spiritual practice, it's one moment at a time. Mm -hmm. As long as you're in any, really, it's not even if you're in the presence of another human being, because even when you're not in the presence of another human being, you're probably thinking about another human being. One moment at a time, is your heart open or is your heart closed? What's the vision of a human being then? People may be very confused about that. Now, this comes out very nicely. You, you see that <coughs> human beings are sacred beings, and we speak of being a whole being. Could you talk about that a bit? The way I see it, human evolution is obviously a process. And as with the evolution of any species, what tends to happen is that you reach crisis points where the species is no longer well adapted for its survival. And the species will then either become extinct or, as we learned in, when we were kids, evolutionary Darwinism, there will be a mutation. And that mutation represents a set of behavior that is better adapted for survival of that species. Mm -hmm. And then the descendants of the mutation, because of this, even though they don't begin in any way close to the majority of the species, the entire development of that species will move in the direction of the mutation. I think of the great religious figures as the human mutation. Mm -hmm. That is how I see Buddha. Mm -hmm. That is how I see Jesus. That is how I see the great spiritual beings who have walked this planet. We are no longer well adapted for human survival on this planet. We simply fight too much. Mm -hmm. now, and that's even separate from the fact that we are the only species actively involved in the destruction of our own habitat. Mm -hmm. But our willingness to fight one another, given how dangerous our modes of destruction are now. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the smallest nuclear bomb on the Earth today makes Hiroshima and Nagasaki look like a yes, pinprick in comparison. So the mutations represent a way of being where they walked on the earth but thought the thoughts of heaven, mm -hmm. where they might have confronted the same temptations you and I have to live without heart, to live without compassion, to live without forgiveness. They had risen above that temptation, and every thought and every expression of behavior came from a universal compassion that was right. literally not So they're world. modeling a new way of being a human being. Yes. And yes. we're meant to be that. Yes. And it's really, of course, not so much a new way of living, but it is the original source way of living mm -hmm. that while the rest of us have so forgotten, as it were, they have remembered. Why do you think we've fallen away from that, just in terms of evolution? <coughs> and, and why are we in such a dysfunctional situation now? Well, from the perspective of metaphysical and esoteric teachings, it all started millions and millions of years ago when we had the first thought that was not of God's love. You know, God created us with free will. We are children of God, created in the image of God. So all of the attributes of God we have, and that includes free will. We can think with love, but we are a choice. We don't have to think with love. Given, however, the fact that we are children of God, we carry such enormous power that when we think without love, we are still powerful. Illusions, the Course in Miracles says, are as powerful in their effects as is the truth. Mm -hmm. So we now have a planet dominated by thoughts of fear. Mm -hmm but created, manufactured by human beings. And so we have made this hell. We have made this hell. And God's spirit inside us is a bridge of perception to take us back to love so that we can experience once again the paradise condition. Right, that must be such a powerful presence in our lives that when we're cut off from it, it must call us. 
And yes. Do you find people being oh. called? Oh, well, and, and you know, there's beautiful language in The Course of Miracles about how all of us are haunted by an ancient melody. Mm -hmm. All of us are called, all of us have a memory, whether conscious or not. All of us feel on some level, surely it doesn't need to be this mm -hmm. way. It's like we have an ancient cellular memory, perhaps of a time on this planet, or at least a space in the mind of God, right. where we love each other. So when you're writing about grace in everyday life, that's what you mean by grace, isn't it? Not judging one another, moving in this new consciousness, living from the heart. We all know what it feels like when you walk into a room and there's such beneficence and goodwill and mm -hmm. harmony. And you compare that with walking into a room and you can feel the tension and the anxiety and the stress mm -hmm. and the negative energy. We make it more complicated than that, but really it's just as simple as what I said. Right. In, in terms of uh, the culture and reproducing ourselves and, and try, trying to tr change that in alignment with this new way of being human, education and child rearing is obviously important. Do you think that uh, we, we should be obviously doing something quite differently, aren't we, in terms well, of children <coughs> and you know, the home setting and the school setting? First of all, in every single area that I can see, there are people doing it right. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. So when you say we need to be doing it differently, some of us sometimes, and all of us probably sometimes need to be doing it differently. But I think that there is this spiritual revival that you mentioned at the beginning of the show. And I think that there are schools, Waldorf School is certainly an example. Montessori is an example. Absolutely. I, meet, I, I think that there are people throughout this country and throughout this world who are already modeling, who are already demonstrating mm. alternative ways, ways that we could be organizing our civilization. That to me is both the hope and the potential tragedy of this time on the planet. We know how to do it right. Will we create the social will to actually carry that out? You see this in, in Israel. I mean, there have been people, Palestinians and Israelis, for years creating projects, really tapping in, harnessing the goodwill in both as Israelis and Palestinians, and proving that it can be done. And what you have in both the Palestinian community and the Israeli is that their leadership often represents the most regressive elements. Right. And that's, that's really how the world is today. I think humanity is ready to move forward. But our institutions are still held in this kind of chokehold yeah. by some of the more regressive sensibilities that really need to go out with the 20th century. So the uh, kids growing up at the young age are quite open to this kind of spiritual. Oh, religion. yes, and that's the hope. But they are in many cases being schooled yeah. uh, under the umbrella of these institutional identities that are so out of sync with these children's realities. Mm -hmm. Then we say something's wrong with the kids. Well, but it also begins at home, so parents do have to begin to become more sensitive to raising children as sacred beings. Right. And uh, do you find, that just to change a little bit into some of the other topics, do you find that this kind of s spiritual living, <coughs> grace in the moment, are s uh, different challenges gender-wise? Uh, do women have special concerns or issues or challenges in living the spirituality and entering the grace? We have deeper issues when it comes to s spiritualities, cultural, social, and even political implications. But when it comes to the real human issues, I do not believe that it's gender-based mm -hmm. because at the deepest level of the spirit, we are neither male nor female. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in terms of uh, the, the manual that you presented here, this is speaking equally to all people. I would hope so. Yes. And um, so <coughs> help us think about in, ter in terms of just uh, human relationships, say, say uh, husband and wife, for example, mm -hmm. spouses. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you address that in the book? in terms of specifics in their relation? To well, you know, the Catholics say the family that prays together stays together. And I think they're right, not just because they have an injunction against divorce. I think that when we pray together, when we meditate together, particularly you start your day, I think it would be very, very powerful for a married couple to pray together. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the lifestyle decisions that is inherent in a genuine spiritual practice has to do with the cultivation of quiet, and out of that cultivation of quiet, where you say, I repudiate the shallow thought forms of my culture, I will not let that TV be on all the time, I will not let the media images of frantic, stressful, uh, as you said, fractured uh, stimulus uh, bombard my life or bombard my home. A couple can consciously make sure that the home is a kind of temple space. Mm. 
And out of that cultivation of quiet comes a cultivation of personal depth. And out of that cult cultivation of personal depth comes a cultivation of a field in which we can genuinely communicate with one another. Right. And communicate consciously so that there's a genuine, um, there's a genuine compassion for the other. You know, intimacy is both a place where we have the greatest capacity to heal one another and also the place where we have the greatest capacity to hurt one That's another. Right. So if you're just, you know, carrying all this stress and carrying all this fear from your experience, you're liable to load that onto your partner mm -hmm. who is in a way the last person who should have yeah. to receive it. Those kinds right. of issues. Right. So that in the flow of it, one's everyday life from morning to night, yes. there are certain things one might do be, to practice this kind of graceful mindfulness. Right. And I have five principles in, in the book that I see as our kind of magic wands that I know in my life if I just in any situation say how are you doing in the application of those five principles I have a shot. <laughs> I wanted you to talk about those if you don't mind the five just very briefly just enumerate them for us. Here. Yes the first one is to simply remind yourself that miracles do happen hmm. and that there's no problem too big for God to handle there's no order of difficulty in miracles and it can be very powerful to simply ask God for a miracle that's number one because it's a it's a reminder that there is a power beyond the mortal mind mm. that can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. So awareness that there's something higher. Yes, uh, and that uh, can uh, could probably pull the rabbit out of the hat here even mm. if you can't. Right. Number two, it's the idea that we are the angels that we're waiting for. Mm. This ev this idea of the evolutionary journey that we are becoming bigger people, and that in any situation in life there's a line in the course in miracles. Only what you are not giving can be lacking in any situation. Mm. That in any situation, if you think, how can I be in this situation more the person I'm capable of? Because if I am, the situation will be closer to transformation. Right. Number three is the realization that every thought of judgment blocks the light. The Course in Miracles says you can have a grievance or you can have a miracle. You can't have both. Mm. Number four is a Gandhian principle, that the end is inherent in the means. Sometimes we're so goal-oriented and we think, well, it doesn't matter who I am as I try to achieve that goal. Well, there's, a, there's a trap there because if you make the goal most important, you find yourself tempted to, you know, mess with your integrity here, right. mess with your loyalty there, mess with your ethics here because you're after that goal. When you realize that who you are as you walk ultimately determines where you're going, right. you realize that your process is more important than the goal. It always goes back to being who we're capable of being. Mm -hmm. And number five, which you and I have discussed already really, is this idea that sacred, sacred silence writes the universe. Mm -hmm. In the cultivation of prayer and meditation, it's like a cosmic reset button. Mm -hmm. We can start over. These are very powerful. And what, I, what is remarkable about them, they seem to give such power and empowerment to the individual. Well, that's the As only having place. a say in your, yeah. Yeah, God can't do for us what he can't do through us. Right. Well, this is wonderful. Could we just uh, turn a bit more from the personal uh, achievement of grace to <coughs> the theme at the heart of your book, uh, Healing the Soul of America? Uh, people might wonder, is, um, does America need healing? <laughs> you, I don't think the kind of people who would be watching your show are wondering about that. <laughs> I think we get that it does. Uh, so, and uh, in terms of uh, the healing, uh, how, do, how do you heal uh, a polis? Uh, a public space. Well, once again, not by a broad stroke. We heal one person at a time, but it is a fundamental principle of, of American democracy that it is the individual who carries the power. So if you have an enlightened citizenship, your nation will flow in, in a more enlightened direction. Mm -hmm. The awakening of the, of the polis, as you said, the awakening of the people, the word politics does not mean of the government. People seem to not know that anymore. The word politics comes from the Greek root of the polis, of the people. Right, exactly. So that's why in American democracy the ideal is about the, the power being vested in the individual. And so there is this illusion that we have no power as individuals, people feeling, oh, I can't make a difference. But that very belief is dangerous mm. because it's that belief that has led to the behavior that has allowed other forces to usurp our power. Right. Once you remember you have it, other people can't take it from you so easily. Mm. And once you remember, well, I looked away for a while, but I'm back and I'm looking now, mm. then those who might have wrested it from you have to give it back. It's, it's law. But Cosmic the, law, I don't mean. What you said at the beginning in terms <coughs> of how institutions block this natural human energy. Yes. Uh, they, they would need some kind of healing too. Uh, do we need a corporate healing? 
<laughs> you think of the, the, the machinery and the power of businesses. Yes, remember? of course we do. Yeah. However, it can only be individuals within those institutions who, who create the transformation, create the healing. Mm -hmm. In fact, the problem of corporate dominance is that no institution is safe when it's dominated or led by mm -hmm. a structure that has no conscience, that has no individual ethics. That's why people must be in control and not corporate entities that are where every individual is simply serving the needs of the corporation, which of itself has no ethics. Right. And in, in this book, Healing the Soul of America, you speak of the um, spiritual citizenship. Yes. You know, which might cause difficulty. We touched on that earlier in terms of the naturalness of spirituality in the civic space. But uh, could you just give our, our viewers a quick sense of what you mean by spiritual citizenship? You know, several decades ago, there was a fundamental transformation, what, what ultimately turned to be, out to be a fundamental transformation of the way mainstream America thinks about medicine. We used to look at the allopathic doctor and see that as the be-all and end-all of our medical consultation. But there began to emerge this complementary, now much more aptly called, alternative medical system. We began to realize the holistic model, meaning that you can't just heal the body, because you're just, in healing the body, you're healing the realm of effect. So if you want to really heal, you need to get to causal issues. You want to deal with the levels of the mind and the spirit as well as the body. What's happened in politics is that we, you can liken the traditional politician to the Western allopathic doctor. Mm. They have a role to play, but looking to the traditional politician as the be-all and end-all of our societal healing is as ridiculous as looking to the Western allopathic doctor mm. as the be-all and end-all of your physical healing. Yeah. So that politics must now expand to include issues of, that are mental, issues that are spiritual. Take, for example, Emancipation Proclamation. Emancipation Proclamation ridded this country, or rid this country, of the institution of slavery. It was an external remedy which could get rid of the external problem. But the Emancipation Proclamation, the abolition of slavery, could not get rid of racism. That's a spiritual issue and a psychological issue. So one generation had the allopathic job to do. We have the holistic job to do. Mm. So if you're really going to heal, for instance, race in America, are there allopathic issues to handle? Reparations, different social and more progressive social and uh, economic policies, dealing with our inner cities, etc.? Absolutely. However, none of that will be foundational. None of it will be fundamental or permanent mm. or even stable unless we deal with the deeper issues of race relations, of atonement, of and forgiveness, there we need the integral apology. spirituality to really yes. do that. Well, time's just about up, and uh, we've co covered you know, so much. And that we'd love to have you back. Thank you. I'd love to. And uh, what's next for you? Are you going to? My next book is about change. It's Wonderful. about spiritually navigating times of change and transition. I think there's a lot of change in the air for everybody right now. Good luck to you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank, thank you, for you being so with much. Us. And thank you for watching Philly Live. For more information on tonight's show, if you'd like a copy of tonight's show, go to our website, wybe.org. For Philly Live, I'm Michelle Gangadi. Have a great evening.